And we now move on to questions to the Minister of Justice. And I call Mr. Cahill O'Hashin. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I have just completed an extensive period of consultation with the Bar Council and the Law Society following the public consultation on Crown Court remuneration. I have listened carefully and sympathetically to their representations and, where possible, made adjustments to my proposals, which have recently been made available to the Justice Committee. I have agreed to protect the fees in some categories of cases and types of fee. The impact of the proposed new fees will be an overall reduction in levels of remuneration for solicitors by 27% and for counsel by 22%. When fully implemented, Crown Court remuneration will be more in line with England and Wales. The high spend on legal aid continues to have a significant impact on my department's budget. The reforms that I have put forward need to be implemented to minimise the impact on other areas of justice delivery. I call Cahill O'Hashin. Uh, with the last question, I'm going to waste an hour as to Dr. I thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister accept that the proposals will have an adverse effect on solicitor firms in rural areas and will have a negative impact on his equal access to justice strategy? For a moment. No, Deputy Speaker, there is no evidence to suggest that the changes being made will have a particularly adverse effect, and the position will remain that fees will continue to be paid at a slightly higher level than is the case in England or Wales despite the fact that lawyers in Northern Ireland have referred to the lower costs of running legal services within Northern Ireland. I call Paul Given. Speaker, uh, the Minister will be acutely aware of the uh, forecast overspend already for legal aid of some £35 million pounds this year. Uh, at what point will he decide to bring forward concrete proposals, given the fact that it is unlikely, in my view, that you will get agreement from the Law Society and the Bar Council for a, a unified uh, proposal coming from the department and the legal profession. Ultimately, there needs to be a point at which uh, the department brings forward proposals for the committee to take a decision upon. Well, Deputy Speaker, I entirely take the committee chair's point. Firm proposals are on their way to the committee at this point, and I trust that the committee will give them a favourable hearing, given what the chair has just said about the very significant uh, excess expenditure likely in this financial year compared to the budget. There is a real issue of costs. Uh, being taken uh, from other key aspects of the justice system in order to pay legal aid fees at a higher rate than is payable anywhere else in these islands. I call Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I listen very carefully to what the Minister has said. Uh, and he, he places his reply within the context of what has happened in England and Wales. Does the Minister not recognise, in fact, that uh, as a result of severe cuts in England and Wales, uh, there is in fact a crisis in terms of access to justice. Does the Minister wish to replicate that and would the Minister not prefer to enter once again his department into negotiations with the Law Society and the Bar Council to reach an amicable agreement? Well, Deputy Speaker, I thought lengthy negotiations with the two branches of the profession was exactly what had been happening over the last several months since the formal consultation closed. Uh, I've made the point that the fees that will be payable in Northern Ireland under my proposals exceed those currently payable in, Northern Ireland, in England and Wales, from which the uh, Justice Secretary has uh, currently made proposals which he's withdrawn temporarily to make further cuts. So the reality is, in circumstances where solicitors and barristers say they can run their legal practices cheaper in Northern Ireland, we will still be paying more than in England and Wales, and significantly more than was proposed for England and Wales. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm just wondering, listening to the Minister, uh, why would he not undertake a full review of costs within the overall judiciary and identify efficiency opportunities? Deputy Speaker, if anybody doesn't think that we've been doing that for the four years since devolution of seeking to ensure maximum efficiencies in every part of the justice system, they really haven't been following comments which I've made in this chamber over the four years since I became minister. But the reality is, as the committee chair has highlighted, uh, the budget for legal aid is currently exceeded by approximately 50 per cent by the anticipated expenditure for this year, and it's clearly an area which requires significant attention. David McElveen is not in his place. I call George Robinson. Question three, Mr Deputy Chair. 
Prison service officials are nearing completion of the outlined business case for the redevelopment of McGilligan Prison, which will be submitted for approval within the next two months. It is DFP's decision as to whether it grants approval for the capital funding for the project. This decision will determine the timeline for the development of the new prison at McGilligan. Minister, for his answer. And, uh, could I ask the Minister if he could confirm if the new build will create new additional and permanent employment opportunities at HMP McGilligan? which could help alleviate some of the unemployment situation in the surrounding area. Well, Deputy Speaker, I'm afraid I can at this stage, uh, without the approval of DFP, not guarantee that the project will go ahead as I would wish, nor can I guarantee that there would be additional employment, since one of the key issues for any new build will be to ensure that it is manageable in the most efficient manner possible. But I do think when we're talking about employment, we should recognise that we have now completed the voluntary early retirement scheme which has seen a significant number of officers able to leave with dignity in respect of the services they've performed in the past and the introduction of a significant number of new operational staff who will be helping implement the reforms which are planned for the prison service. I call it Rosalie McCorley. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Um, can I ask the Minister to outline what meetings have taken place with uh, local stakeholders uh, in, uh, in relation to the location of McGilligan to ensure that uh, there is no negative impact um, on the need um, to create good community links? Well, indeed, members will remember that one of the initial recommendations which came from the prison review team uh, was to look at the rebuilding of McGilligan elsewhere. The reality is that following good discussions, uh, in particular with the local councils in the northwest, we were able to look to see how better community links could be established to ensure that we provided the opportunities for prisoners for outside work in particular, to ensure connections with local businesses. And it's as a result of that that we've been able to proceed with plans to rebuild at McGilligan. I call John Dallet. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer. And, uh, could I ask the Minister to arrange for the opportunity for members of this Assembly to spend a day in jail in McGilligan, something that might well be welcomed by the wider world, to see and understand fully the transformation that takes place there among inmates, particularly in terms of educational opportunities? Well, Deputy Speaker, Prison Service has arranged a number of visits uh, in recent time for members of this Assembly and indeed for members of the Eruptus who have also visited McGabry Prison. I have no doubt that Mr Dalek wishes to make a personal visit, uh, that he will be welcomed through the gates and possibly back through the gate as well. I call Sydney Anderson. Question for Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, the law enforcement and policy lead in relation to fuel laundering is with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, and my department is in regular contact with HMRC. The Organised Crime Task Force has a cross-border subgroup devoted to fuel fraud. It is chaired by HMRC and includes members from the PSNI, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, and their counterparts in the Republic of Ireland. This group meets on a regular basis. In addition to the ongoing operational work of HMRC, there was an announcement earlier this year regarding the introduction of a new marker for rebated fuel. Market testing is currently ongoing. My department has also introduced legislation relating to unduly lenient sentencing in this area, and as I informed members recently, I have been in correspondence with the Economic Secretary and Her Majesty's Treasury regarding legislation affecting the naming of filling stations which have been found to uh, sell illicit fuel. Fuel laundering affects the environment, legitimate business people, and the money available for public services. All areas of the justice sector will continue to fight it in every way possible. It must, however, be recognized that it is a crime sector which exists as a result of demand, and it is in the hands of the public to remove that demand and bring laundering to a halt once and for all. I call Sidney Anderson. Uh, I thank the minister for, for that response. But the minister will, will be well aware of the long line of uh, illegal uh, fuel laundering plants that have been discovered in recent months. It just seems to go on and on, seems to go on and on unabated, and as you have rightly said, at huge cost uh, to both the, the damage to the environment and, and to the public purse. Would the Minister agree with me that the full cooperation of the National Crime Agency locally would be a major help in trying to tackle uh, illegal fuel laundering? 
and the need for uh, the support of all the parties in this chamber for, and for them to give their full support to the National Crime Agency. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Well, Deputy Speaker, I certainly agree with Mr Anderson that we have a requirement to see the National Crime Agency having full operational powers in the devolved sphere in Northern Ireland. However, on the specific issue of excise evasion, the NCA does have powers because it's a non-devolved matter. Of course, powers, powers which is operates without any accountability to the institutions in Northern Ireland because of the refusal of those who are so concerned about accountability to not allow the NCA to operate in the devolved sphere. I call Dominic Bradley. Uh, 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 the Minister referred to the new marker which is being tested at the moment. Can the Minister give any indication when this marker will eventually be applied to fuel? The best advice I can give Mr Bradley, Deputy Speaker, is that when the announcement was made in February, it was at that stage estimated 12 to 18 months before it was fully operational. I have had no updates since that time. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am sure the Minister would agree with me that the livelihoods of hard-working and law-abiding families are being put at risk by illegal fuel laundering. Why is the conviction rate so pathetic? Deputy Speaker, I am not quite sure that it is appropriate for me to answer that question since it effectively is an operational question. I should, however, make clear uh, to Mrs Overend and to others so the reality is many of these laundering plants operate effectively without any personnel present. Uh, if it were possible to pick people up, it would solely be at the point when deliveries are made and fuel is taken out. And on that basis, it is extremely hard, given the way they operate, to uh, be able to arrest those who are directly responsible. What we have, however, got in the potential for the referral of unduly lenient sentences is the opportunity that when arrests are made, a clear sentence will be set, uh, will be set which will set a market to others. I call Trevor Lunn. Oh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's question number five, Minister. Hate crime, whether it manifests itself in verbal abuse, intimidation, or violent crime, is deplorable and has no place in a modern society. I am determined that my department will continue to do everything possible through the delivery of the community safety strategy to tackle hate crime and the harm it causes. Unite Against Hate was previously launched in 2009 as a multi-agency campaign to raise awareness of the impact of hate crime, to challenge negative attitudes and perceptions, to create a climate of zero tolerance and to promote diversity. With an estimated 110,000 migrants having come to live and work in Northern Ireland and in the context of recent events, it is clear that there remains work to be done. On the 19th of May, I wrote to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister seeking an update on discussions that their department led in 2012 regarding the scope for a renewed Unite Against Hate campaign. I am waiting for a response. In the meantime, my department will continue to chair the multi-agency working group set up to deliver a range of practical actions being taken to tackle hate crime as set out in our community safety strategy. I call Trevor Lunn. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. I, I can only hope that you know, I welcome the fact that he has raised the issue with OFM, DFM. I can only hope that the response comes faster than the seven years we're waiting for the racial equality strategy. In the meantime, could I ask the Minister to give, us, give the House a sense of what his own department is doing to tackle hate crime? Well, I thank my colleague for his question. I certainly share his hope that it will be significantly less than seven years before we see some action on hate crime, which is clearly becoming a major issue at the moment. Uh, to just list some of the issues which are the direct responsibility of the DOJ, which my department is implementing, we're partly funding the Hate Incident Practical Action Scheme, which provides protection and security to victims of hate crime. Uh, we're consulting with Victims Group on developing third-party reporting systems for hate uh, incidents and crimes where people are reluctant to approach the police. Uh, we've reviewed the capacity of advocacy services. We're considering investing in that scheme. We're part funding an initiative to identify the key elements of the Belfast City Council tension monitoring model with a view to using PSP, PCSPs to roll it out uh, elsewhere. Uh, we're monitoring the review of legislation which is happening in England and Wales at the moment to see whether there are lessons we can learn from there. We've delivered initiatives to prevent reoffending through early stage intervention, working with PCSPs, Probation Board and Youth Justice Agency. We hope that they will address offending behaviour, including community and restorative approaches. 
and we are planning workshops at the moment with key victims groups to raise awareness of the work of the Hate Crime Delivery Group and delivering our community safety strategy so that we can develop that and see that we provide the best possible services to people in Northern Ireland. Nicole Sean Lynch. Uh, last can call you. Would the Minister agree with me that regardless of the campaign in place to combat racism, those in position of leadership must never by their actions or word create the conditions where racism flourishes? Well, I certainly agree entirely with Mr Lynch on that particular point. As I said in an interview when I was asked about comments made by Pastor McConnell and by the First Minister, the people needed to be very careful, not on the precise intellectual justification for the words they had used, but for the potential atmosphere created amongst those in this society who are only too ready to indulge in hate crime and who don't hear the words, who just hear the sense. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, will he include the level of hate crime against sections of the Indigenous community, such as damage to Orange and uh, church halls, in any campaign? Well, as I've already said, uh, Deputy Speaker, United Against Hate campaign is led by OFM, DFM, but it certainly applies against all kinds of hate crime in the past, and I trust that if it's resurrected by that department, which will certainly be with the full assistance of my department, it will cover all forms of hate, hate crime again. I call Chris Little. Question number six. Deputy <laughs> Speaker, in October last year, I announced that Hyde Bank Wood College would be delivered through the creation of a task force whose responsibilities included designing, developing and delivering the college ethos. It is of course crucial that we get the supporting structures and processes right to deliver the right outcome for those in custody. The present service has therefore established a dedicated secure college oversight group whose current membership includes senior officials, the governor and deputy governor, and which will soon be extended to include external providers and agencies, including learning and skills experts. A review of supporting structures has taken place, with significant changes being implemented to both the management structure and specific roles, coupled with the introduction of free flow movement of prisoners, revised scheduling arrangements, and a review of security classifications, all aimed at supporting the creation of a college-based ethos. Work is now also underway to ensure a comprehensive induction program is completed for each committal, which will inform the development of a personal development plan based on individual strengths, risks and the need to support effective rehabilitation. An interim contract is in place with external providers who are working alongside existing staff to improve the provision of learning and skills with programs tailored to meet individual needs, complemented by a daily regime that timetables activities in an innovative way. In September 2014, the Prison Oversight Group will receive an update on the vision, action plan and timelines for delivery of the Hyde Bank Wood College. I call Chris Little. I welcome progress that has been made by the Minister of Justice in relation to the establishment of Hyde Bank Youth uh, Offenders Centre as a secure college, uh, given the importance of skills and employment to rehabilitation and the reduction of offending. But can I ask the Minister uh, for a timescale for completion of the project and the key differences that he thinks it will make to our society? I suppose, Deputy Speaker, at one level the project will not be complete ever because it will be an ongoing project. But we certainly are looking to see, for example, with the work being done on external skills provision, uh, that we will have that uh, well in place and fully implemented within the next academic year. Uh, we will be doing the ongoing changes to regime and timetables and so on, which I mentioned, over that same kind of timescale. The important issue is that we provide those who are in Hyde Bank Wood with the best possible opportunities to make progress while they're in prison and to link them in when they return to the community to keep them involved in whatever learning and skills opportunities they have developed in custody to ensure they have a better chance of employment when they leave. I call Colm Eastwood. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I welcome, I suppose, the limited progress that's been made around this? I think it's very important that uh, rehabilitation is at the forefront of our minds when we're looking at these issues. Uh, can the Minister assure us that all uh, inmates will be given opportunities to, to, to access uh, training and, uh, and education suitable to their needs? That was awful begrudging, limited progress. It's, it's work well underway, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I think when members see the work which has been done overall on the prison reform programme, uh, 
and the amount which has been done in two years, they will perhaps acknowledge that it is a very significant programme, which is taking time to implement, I grant that. But certainly I can assure Mr Eastwood it is the intention that all those in custody in Hyde Bank Wood will be given the opportunity for appropriate learning and skills opportunities. We've seen work, for example, uh, on developing the horticulture unit. There's other work going on, uh, which I hope to be sampling the food which is currently being cooked by prisoners uh, in a new development there to provide additional opportunities. So all of those are small steps which will, when joined together, see that we're providing a much better opportunity for prisoners than has been the case up to now. I call Michael Majimsey. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister uh, what he estimates to be the cost uh, of the provision at Hyde Bank? And uh, can he also uh, give us an indication of whether he's had any discussions with the Department of Finance about when he's going to bid for this uh, uh, facility? Thank you. Well, in answer to Mr. McGimsey's specific question on this, uh, the cost of implementing the scheme is relatively little because it's coming out of existing current budgets by reallocation to ensure that uh, services are provided in a more efficient way. There are, of course, other issues uh, looking at the High Bank Wood site related to accommodation for women, uh, which are currently under discussion as part of the capital program with DFP, but there was no need to involve discussions with DFP on the specific issues of the Secure College. I call Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question seven, please. Deputy Speaker, first I would like to publicly congratulate George Hamilton on his appointment as Chief Constable, as I have already done in person. I look forward to working with him in my role as Justice Minister. I have had regular meetings with Matt Baggett on a range of issues, including parading, and naturally I would very much hope that these will continue when Mr Hamilton formally takes up his post at the end of the month. In terms of a peaceful parading season, I would encourage all to play their part in finding a solution to bring about a peaceful conclusion to this issue. The reality is neither the police nor I can solve the issues around parading. Resolution can only come through local dialogue in an atmosphere of tolerance and mutual respect. I am thankful that the weekend parades passed off with that incident and would hope that this will set the tone for the coming weeks. I call Brenda Hill. I thank the Minister for his answer. And can the Minister maybe outline then what discussions the Chief Constable intends to have with local groups and communities and his engagement with these communities in the lead up to the parading season? Well, I'm afraid, Deputy Speaker, I can't say what the Chief Constable plans to do since that is an operational matter for the Chief Constable, but I would assume that some of the discussions uh, which, for example, have been recently led by ACC will occur about a variety of issues within Belfast which impinge to some extent on parading. Some of the local engagement which I'm aware of, which has been happening particularly in the north and east of the city, will continue. But really the issues as to exactly how the police will operate are issues for the Chief Constable, whether the current or the future. I call Pat Sheehan. Uh, would the Minister agree that the, the money being used to uh, police the illegal protest camp at Twadell uh, is money wasted and furthermore it's lost to uh, other policing priorities. Gurmala. Well indeed I can agree with Mr Sheehan because I, I made exactly the points I, I think at the last question time when I highlighted that the cost of policing the Twadell Avenue protest has now exceeded £9 million. The reality is that is money which is now lost which could have been used for policing priorities in other areas could have been used at a variety of projects which I suspect every MLA could identify in their constituency in terms of the ongoing work of community policing, and which sadly has been expended for no good purpose whatsoever. It really is time that those who were involved in that particular camp recognised the reality of the law, recognised where the Parade Commission's lawful determinations have led them, accepted that point and gave up their protest. Yeah. I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And the Minister will be aware that the original question refers to inclusive parading season. I just wonder if that definition of inclusivity means that uh, the parade should be open to all, regardless of race, religion, or community background or sexual orientation. Would the member agree with me? That would be a step forward. And would the Minister also outline to the Assembly what steps, if any, he has taken to press the British Secretary of State to introduce uh, legislation which has already been uh, 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 addressed as having been weak by the Secretary of State herself? 
Well, I think on the, on the first point that Mrs. Kelly uh, made, I really would have to suggest she asked the questioner what she meant about an inclusive parading season, not me. I'm not necessarily sure that many of those organised which parade would wish others who parade on different days in different places, um, perhaps wearing different items, would necessarily wish to have them all involved. Um, on the issue of legislation, the, uh, she raises a very serious issue. But certainly, as far as I'm concerned, the best solution to dealing with parading problems in legislation is when we get agreement amongst the five parties of the yeah, executive yeah. and we ensure that we then can carry legislation forward in this assembly and not rely on the Secretary of State doing it at Westminster. I trust that what we will see over the next few weeks will ensure that we don't have to make that request to the Secretary of State. I call Danny Kinnahan. Question number eight, please, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I have not had any discussions with the PSNI about the administrative scheme for on the runs, nor would it be appropriate for me to do so. I call Danny um, thank you very much. And I wonder, was the Minister aware that um, there were three on the run letters cleared in March this year? My understanding of that particular position, Deputy Speaker, is that Sinn Féin has said that that was the case. I understand the Northern Ireland Office has denied that that was the case. It's not my responsibility in any event. I call Patsy McLone. Uh, I've got to ask John Corley. Just to clarify, could the Minister indicate what discussions he has had with the Attorney General around this matter of the on the runs legislation? I'm sure Mr McLone will be well aware of the Convention that Ministers do not discuss legal advice that they have sought or received including from the Attorney General. I call William Humphrey. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Does the Minister agree that all parties and individuals in this House should be open in terms of their experiences in relation to the On The Runs debacle? And therefore, would the Minister agree with me that it's an absolute scandal that Sinn Féin refused to appear in front of the uh, House of Commons Select Committee this week in this, in this place? <coughs> well, again, Deputy Speaker, uh, whatever view David Ford might have about people who ought to be honest and open and take the opportunities that are presented to give evidence before a select committee of the House of Commons. I'm not sure there's a role for the Minister of Justice to say what others should do in front of the, uh, the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. Safe to say that I did my best to answer their questions this morning myself. Yeah. I call Stephen Mutry. Number nine. During 2013-14, absence in the prison service totaled 13.8 days per member of staff against the DOJ target of 9.7 days. This is a provisional figure, and the official figure will be finalized by NISRA later this year. At present, the projected figure for 2014-15 is 10.6 days per member of staff against the DOJ target of 9.2 days. I'm not complacent about the progress to date, and every effort continues to be made to reduce the level of absence further. Management is committed to, con uh, to continue this work with staff and with their trade unions. I call Stephen Mitry. For his answer, does the Minister see the issue of staff morale within our prisons as something that would impact on staffing absence levels? And is he satisfied that everything has been done within our prisons to ensure good working conditions? Well, recognising that prisons can be very difficult places to work, Deputy Speaker, it's not always easy to say that everything possible is being done. But I do take significant heart for the fact that the projected uh, levels of absence for uniformed staff in prisons uh, for this year, around 11 days, whereas in the preceding four years they were between 15.1 and 17 days. So I do think that is an indication of good work being done and a higher morale perhaps among staff that would have been suggested by the question. I call Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, does the Minister feel that perhaps now that the voluntary redundancy scheme is over and complete, that the reduction in absenteeism is directly related to the, the new intake of recruits? I think Mr McCartney may well be drawing inferences a bit further than the evidence suggests, a very significant reduction this year, when uh, the reality is there were a number of new staff were in last year and a number of old staff you know, had already left last year. So it's, it's difficult to suggest that it is directly related, but I have no doubt there may well be elements that those who were uh, of more advanced years, shall we say, were more likely to be uh, taking sick leave just by the natural health pattern uh, as people age. 
something, something of which I'm increasingly aware myself. And that is the end of uh, oral questions that have been listed for answer. And we now moved on to topical questions. And I call Barry Mickelstuff. Good. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, following on from the BBC Spotlight programme into the behaviour, attitude and conduct of the PSNA in OMA towards young people, um, can I ask uh, the Minister if he has any concerns about uh, the state of public confidence in our criminal justice system there? Well, I appreciate the question Mr. McElduff is raising. Um, as I was in the US last week, I didn't personally see the spotlight program to which he refers. Um, I am aware uh, both that the area commander, that, sorry, the district commander, Chief Superintendent Dunwoody, has said he's working to address some of the issues raised, um, and that the Ombudsman has been made aware of some of the issues raised and is investigating a number of cases. Beyond that, I can give no particular comment on the points raised by Mr. McElduff. I call Barry McElduff. Can I ask the Minister of Justice to show a personal interest in making sure in the time ahead that public confidence in the criminal justice system, particularly in the OMA area, arising from these reported incidents, that uh, that uh, damage is repaired? Well, I certainly take a personal interest in ensuring the highest possible community confidence in policing and other aspects of the justice system, not just in OMA, but in 25 other districts as well. But I need to be very careful that I am not seeking to take over the role of the Ombudsman or the direct management responsibilities of the District Commander in doing so. But I expect that for other reasons I will be meeting Chief Superintendent Dunwoody in the near future, and I have no doubt that this will feature on the margins of that meeting. I call Jerry Kelly. I know the Minister will be aware of the rise in the use of the, the drug uh, serotonin. Uh, also known as spackled red and uh, some other tablets. And in fact, the spackled red variety has been attached to some 18 deaths in the, the north of Ireland. So uh, he will also be aware that there's some sort of process of trying to find out uh, how to bring in legislation to make these illegal. But is it time for the, the Justice Department, the Health Department, and perhaps the councils to come together in the meantime and try and find some way of uh, closing down uh, this, uh, what should be an illegal drug? Well, I note that this was a, a very similar to a question asked at the end of health questions a few minutes ago. Uh, the reality is, as members are generally aware, drugs policy is an issue which is reserved and therefore not for us. But uh, I'm sure most members will be aware of the practical work which was done using consumer pr uh, product safety legislation by environmental health officers in Belfast in tackling some of those premises which were selling such drugs. I understand that that advice has been spread at least to OMA and has been shared between environmental health officers. The Department of Justice offered its assistance if, you know, if required, but I believe that the EHOs have been communicating amongst themselves anyway, and I know that certainly those lessons have been picked up in other parts of the UK. I call Jerry Kelly. I thank the Minister for his answer tonight, and I, I think perhaps he made uh, precisely a point, although I didn't pick up just at the end. Could you elaborate on why collaboration is happening, and I think the example of using bylaws to try and close down, or actually to close down these uh, so-called head shops, was a very good move uh, while, we, while we await this other process. So could you elaborate on the type of uh, collaboration you're talking about? Well, I believe the specific legislation was around uh, product safety legislation. Um, I'm not aware of the exact detail of it because it was an issue which was carried forward by environmental health officers working for the City Council, uh, but certainly it appears to have been successful in closing down at least some uh, so-called head shops within Belfast, and I understand that at least OMA has been considering similar legislation uh, the, or the use of similar legislation there. So clearly there are issues where current law uh, can be used, but as the Minister of Health said earlier, uh, the executive has also requested that the Attorney General should look at the issue as to what further powers there may be available to strengthen the law in the devolved sphere. I call Alex Maskey. I ask the could I ask the Minister, could he outline what steps the Department has taken to tackle the rising level of racist attacks? Well, I did highlight earlier some of the issues re relating to hate crime uh, and the work which was being done when, when I was answering the main uh, question. Uh, certainly, there are significant issues of ensuring the best possible cooperation uh, 
with the police and ensuring that bodies like PCSPs use their opportunities. Uh, there's been a lot of work being done um, to consider the implications of the Unite Against Hate campaign and issues where the Department of Justice has responsibilities, which I outlined uh, earlier to Mr. Lon. I think the key issue is to ensure that we spread out the message that that sort of hate crime is utterly unacceptable and ensure that there is a no-tolerance policy for it. I call Alex Muskin. Gormaga, could I thank the Minister for that response? Could I actually ask the Minister, could he reissue a call to all those in political and civil leadership not to be saying or doing anything which would actually encourage racism in our society? Well, I'll certainly repeat the point which I made to Mr Lynch a few minutes ago. Uh, it is not necessarily the precise intellectual words that individuals will use. It's the culture that is created and the danger that those who are willing to resort to hate crime in this society will half hear a message rather than listening to the words, which I fear may help drive uh, the sort of crime that we've seen in recent weeks. I welcome the fact that we've now seen uh, statements from Pastor McConnell and from the First Minister which have made their position clear, but I do believe that everybody in public life needs to be very careful about the language they use. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. At the risk of sounding like a broken record on this issue, can the Minister provide an update on the building of the Community Safety College at Desert Crate outside Cookstown? Deputy Speaker, once Mrs Overend said broken records, she didn't need to say any more. Um, no, at this stage I cannot give any specific further information on the issue of the Community Safety College. Work is ongoing within the programme board and I'm not in a position to give any more specific detail than to say that that work is ongoing and I'm looking forward to seeing the next response. I believe that the, um, the Justice Committee will also be having a hearing on the 2nd of July relating to it. Call Sandra Overend. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I must say I'm disappointed with that response. It seems that mistakes have been made along the way right from the design process. Uh, in fact, if we take it back to basics, I understand that the land of Desert Crate has been badly planned since the Department of Agriculture milked goats on it. Um, and more recently, the weeds haven't been managed, the rental of the land hasn't and been managed. Have a question, Could the please. Minister? Uh, could the Minister tell me what he is doing to restore confidence to the people of Mid Ulster uh, and ensure that this college will be completed at Desert Crate? Well, I fear neither the control of weeds nor the management of goats uh, beyond um, a couple of them is within my remit, um, nor is the overall issue of providing confidence solely for my role as the Department of Justice. There are issues which have to be addressed by the programme board. Uh, the program board, as members will be aware, uh, has connections to two departments, given that the Fire and Rescue Service comes under the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. And in that context, it's impossible for me to give specific assurances as to what the outcome will be. I can give the House an assurance that the program is examining uh, arrangements in detail, looking at the overall costing, seeing where costs can be taken out of it, and seeing whether it is possible to drive, uh, deliver the project in a slightly reduced scale to provide value for money, but that is detailed work currently being done and I can't report on the outcome of that until it's completed. I call Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, I asked the Minister if when he took up office or in that early time he asked for a brief or was offered a brief on the outworkings of Western Park or the outworkings of uh, Peter Haynes legislation in the House of Commons on the runs that didn't happen, or indeed on the letters of the on the runs at the, at the moment? No, Deputy Speaker, I did not ask for a brief on any of that. Given that I didn't know that letters were being issued, it would have been a bit difficult to ask for a brief on them. Um, and as far as Peter Haynes' statement in the House of Commons, I'm afraid I had the naive presumption that when a Secretary of State stands up in the Chamber of the House of Commons and says nothing is happening, that that meant nothing was happening. I call Danny Kinnan. Um, thank you very much, Mayor. Thank him for his answer. And my query really is as to who owns or where does the buck stop um, with this matter? Um, I fear that we will all have to wait for the outcome of the re review by Lady Justice Hallett, um, by the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee, uh, by the Justice Committee of this Assembly, by uh, the work being done by the, uh, the Police Ombudsman, um, indeed by the internal review being done into the status of the letters by the PSNI. Um, there are a number of factors uh, where we will find out where the box stops, but at this stage it doesn't stop with the Department of Justice and never did. 
I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, be well aware of the recent criticism by the senior coroner in relation to the outstanding uh, stalker inquest into the murder of uh, six men in Armagh and uh, three police officers murdered by the IRA, including a uh, young 17-year-old Michael Tai, who was shot uh, by state forces. Uh, the coroner has criticised you and the department for your failure to provide expert investigators and, and for a drip feed uh, basis in terms of funding. Minister, can you prove to this House what, or what evidence can you provide that you have a uh, demonstrable commitment to actually ensuring that these inquests are held and that we're not before the EU courts again facing criticism? Well, the issue which is raised by Mrs Kelly is a very complex and a very difficult one. There are currently something like 46 uh, outstanding legacy inquest cases relating to 75 uh, sensitive and contentious deaths, and that is clearly a very significant backlog uh, which has huge resource implications for a budget which, as I was saying earlier when we were talking about legal aid, is under severe pressure. There's also an issue that the, the individuals that she referred to who would need to carry out some of those investigations would not be DOJ employees. And I understand there is difficulty in actually getting the relevant levels of expertise uh, to carry out that work. I have um, had recent uh, meetings with officials. I've con uh, con uh, commissioned an internal review as to how we can more effectively use the resources we have um, to ensure that we're um, we're more Article 2 compl compliant than is currently the case. But until we can find some way of resolving the difficult issues of the past and not relying on simply coroner's inquests uh, and the other work by the Ombudsman and the HET, we will continue as a society to be in difficulty. That is why we have such a need to ensure the five-party talks succeed. I call Dolores Kelly. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, we're not, uh, I'm not for one... Uh, uh, saying that uh, we shouldn't be dealing with the past in a comprehensive and ethical way. Nonetheless, uh, this uh, 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 is a matter of concern. It's before the European courts a number of, of times. These men were killed in 1982, so some 32 years later, their inquests have not been held. Their families have not been able uh, to move on. Uh, so um, could you... Uh, Tell me, um, Minister, whether or not on any of the previous monitoring rounds from you took office, whether or not you had sought additional resources to facilitate uh, the request of the senior coroner to pay for an expert investigator. And I do say that that matter has been before you uh, or your department for the last three years. Well, part of the, t the issue is the, the sheer technicality of the way monitoring rounds operate with the DOJ having a ring fence budget separate from uh, the normal uh, DFP-led budget process. But uh, as I, to the best of my knowledge, and I will write to Mrs. Kelly if I'm incorrect, to the best of my knowledge, no specific request has been made for funding for such an investigator you know, to be considered on the DOJ internal monitoring proposals. If that is not correct, I will write to her and correct it. But I think if, if that is the context, it is not specifically the department's responsibility, the responsibility lies elsewhere to see the investigations are done within our arms length bodies. I will ascertain the exact position and communicate it to her if that is incorrect. I call Chris Hazard. Ask him, call you. Minister, the policing plan recently published for 2014-2017 makes absolutely no reference to agricultural crime. Um, do you agree that it could be said that DOJ, PSNI do not have a strategy for dealing with rural crime? <coughs> Well, Deputy Speaker, the reality is that lots of things that the PSNI does do not feature you know, specifically in the policing plan uh, to some extent because they're regarded as business as usual. Um, had Mr McElveen been here, I would have had uh, a response specifically about some of the rural crime and agricultural crime initiatives which are taking place in the Ballymena area. Um, that will be published in Hansard shortly, but I can assure Mr Hazard that there's a lot of work ongoing there, um, including the Rural Crime Unit, which is part funded by NFU Mutual and part by the department, working with the police, identifying uh, trends in agricultural crime and seeking to ensure that we, uh, we get the best possible response to that. And I've also had the opportunity of visiting uh, not just Balmoral show, but other agricultural shows over the last two or three years where the police have been out engaging, sometimes in conjunction with uh, PCSPs, sometimes on their own, to look at these wider issues. And there are further initiatives which we are hoping we'll be able to announce in the next couple of weeks. And that is the end of questions to the Minister for Justice.